teacher at Middle School Parkside, and I'm here today with Dawn, and I'll let her introduce herself. Um, and I've been teaching for 19 years. Uh, the, the thing I seem to be known the most for, though, is starting the NASA Explorer School Program at Parkside. Um, it was, took five attempts for us to become a NASA Explorer School. We finally became a NASA Explorer School in 2006, which was the last year that the NASA Explorer School um, was in existence for the format that it was in back when we, when we were involved. And we're now an alumni school, and through the NASA Explorer School program, we had multiple, multiple experiences, uh, which some of them we're going to uh, share with you today. Uh, the focus for the, uh, the this, our session's two sessions long, and they're kind of back to back. One kind of segues into the other. The first one's more talking about our experiences. Um, the second one's a more hands-on hands -on kind of stuff. We're going to be building stuff. So just if you kind of give you a frame of reference as to what's going to happen. Um, our, our goal for this first session is to talk about the main ways that we can simulate microgravity um, experiences here on Earth, either for fun or for research purposes. And we've done them for both. And um, so that's kind of where we're going to go with the first session. So, Don. I'm Dawn Wagner. I also teach at the Middle School Parkside. Uh, I came along to Parkside after the NASA school program had been started there. I was fortunate to kind of fold it into a lot of the experiences that we're talking about today. I'm Dana today, by the way. Yeah, she's, she's Dana. <laughs> so there's a lot of misconceptions about what microgravity is. Um, quite, quite often, sometimes we hear about zero gravity or a no gravity environment. And so we're going to kind of help dispel kind of that um, today and explain to that what, what is really going on in those situations. So I have an explanation as to what gravity is up there. And I don't need that to read, so I don't need to read that to you. Um, but the condition of microgravity is really a free fall environment. So what is happening when we're up on a space shuttle or we're on a space shuttle or our astronauts are currently on station right now is that they are falling. Uh, basically around the planet at the same rate together, so they're both in a free fall, um, free fall type experience, and so we call that floating, but really they're falling. So these are the experiences and things we're going to talk about today. We've had experiences with all of these. Um, we've never been in the training pool, but we've actually been to the training pool. Wish I could have gone in the training pool. But. Uh, couldn't do that one, but we've had experience with all these, so we're going to talk to you about our experiences and how these relate to research um, here on Earth. So the um, go ahead. <laughs> so there's the drop box, which um, at Parks is commonly known as the egg drop. Um, we've been doing that for I think this will be our sixth year now. Um, the vacuum chamber, the draft tower, the zero G plane, and the train pool. How many of you ever heard of the zero G plane? More commonly known as the vomit comet. NASA prefers to be called the weightless wonder. Um, they don't like the, the whole vomit thing association. <laughs> All right. So, um, most are, for yes. Isn't that how they go when they go look at the space? Yes, yep, yep. And we've both been on that plane, so we're going to talk to you about it. Um, so, the Glenn Research um, Center is one of many research centers um, for NASA across the country. It's our home uh, center that we're associated with, with the NASA Explorer School Program. I used to say it's the one we've been to the most, except now I think that's a tie between Houston and Kennedy. What you say? Is um, it in Cleveland? It's in Cleveland. It's in Cleveland. Um, it has the largest zero um, gravity or microgravity um, research facility in the world. Um, and it has um, experiments that free fall for 132 meters. And they're weightless for about five seconds, which isn't a lot of time to do research. These are some, ex uh, these are some pictures of the vacuum chamber one. Uh, we went there, as you can see, that's a much younger me. Um, we went there in 2006. And this is where NASA does a lot of their um, research uh, for experiments that they were going to send up to space and or on the shuttle. Um, you can see on the top left up there, that's the top that they put on this area that we're looking down into to create the vacuum. And um, that environment allows them to test things here on Earth. 
um, and refine their, their research before they actually take it up into the, the, sh the shuttle or on station. Because obviously, once they go up there, it becomes a much more expensive than Denver, and they want to make sure they have their equipment and everything correct before it goes up there. It's not something they want to have to do twice. Send them twice. Um, the drop tower um, has been used for over 50 years. Very simplistic. Um, so I'll run a little bluff on Glenn. And um, the cool thing about the drop tower is it's so simplistic and it has such, I would say, rudimentary materials. It's just basically a wood tower that um, they can do many, many initial experiments very, very quickly and very, very cheaply. So this would be like the first step the a NASA research, the researcher or sometimes a university researcher would do um, before they were going to go on to more refined and expensive type of um, microgravity experiments. Um, so it's kind of like the, they call it the gateway experience on the shuttle and the ISS because it's kind of that first step that they do um, when they're testing equipment and they're testing uh, logistics and how things are going to work and how they're going to collect their data and that kind of thing. Um, it's only 2.2 seconds, so it's over and done with real, real quick. Um, the very, very first year we went to Glenn after we became a NASA Explorer School program was where we actually got to do that, and we did that. It was the first time we had ever done the egg drop. It's where we got the idea for doing the legendary egg, egg drop that we do every year at Parkside in the spring now. Um, that's where we got the ideas and things like that. It was. Um, it was our first kind of NASA immersion experience that we had as a NASA Explorer School, the team of five that went down there, and we had a lot of fun doing it. We should have brought Glenn. We have this chicken. I don't know if I have a picture. Of that. I don't know if I have a picture of Glenn in here anywhere. We had we had the opportunity to drop two boxes, and the boxes look similar to this. Um, they're a six by six by six box. So we use a park site for our egg drop. Um, and so we had the chance to, to, we had three days where we had, in the evening, because we were in classes and stuff all day, as a team to design uh, a situation where we could protect a raw egg when it was dropped from the 2.2 tower. And we had two, could do two. So being teachers that were on vacation like we were, we decided to do one serious one because we were all competitive and then one really stupid one. So we were out after dinner and we were going through and trying to find these supplies and we went through all the traditional Joanne's and Michael's like people to, and something possessed us to go to the pet store. And so we ended up with this chicken, and we named him Glenn because of the Glenn Research Center. We ended up with this chicken and so we cut the chicken open, took out his um, little squeaker thingy and proceeded to stuff, make the egg and put stuff inside the chicken. And so Glenn became our mascot, and Glenn has gone over the last six years to just about every place we have gone as a NASA Explorer School, and we have pictures of all of it. And needless to say, Glenn's egg didn't survive. Um, the other one did very well, but Glenn didn't do so hot. And but we have, we've had a lot of fun, fun with Glenn over the years. And, um, Kind of the crazy things I guess teachers do in their spare time. So this is the drop tower. Like I said, it's very, very simplistic, although NASA is very, very careful with their safety. So we had all these safety procedures we had to follow. But it's basically this big, big tower with a whole lot of stairs that we had to climb up with. And then they just drop it. And so that, like I said, because that microgravity is a free fall and that, that object's going to be basically floating on its way down and allows them to be begin to get some idea of what would happen when uh, an object was in a microgravity um, environment. So, um, so a, a drop box. So one of the things you guys can do all here that's very, very easy is to do simulate a drop box experience. experience. That can be done in a couple of ways. Um, one of the easiest ways to do it is, um, well, if you're really adventurous, it's from the roof of your house, but kids have permission from your parents. Um, another one is to um, go from a really high staircase. So this was Jill Weatherwax. Um, Jill currently teaches at Cascades Elementary School, um, and she was taught at Parkside for years. And so she is doing a test run 
in the hotel the one night of the experiment that we took through the drop tower. So this was her, and of course we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't want the hotel mad at us, so we put the experiment in a bag. I'm just not sure, and I can't remember if this is the one that Glenn was in or if this is the one that our actual real experiment was in. And so we went to the top of a three-story staircase, and there happened to be this like little opening, you know, down through all three of them, and we just dropped it. Um, the other one that you can do is um, what, like what we do with the egg drop, and we have like the cherry pickers that Consumers Energy uses, and we use those and extend that way up, and then we drop it from there. And so we would like to invite all of you to our egg drop, um, which is this Tuesday at 7 o'clock at Parkside outside our cafeteria, so that you will have the chance to, um, to experience a, a, a drop box or a drop tower type exper experience. Um, kids always have a lot of left over the kids and adults alike, so let's get competitive. Um, it's, done, it's done in a six by six by six box. We furnish the box, we furnish the egg, you furnish the materials that go inside it. So it will give you a few days to decide what you're going to put inside your box to protect your egg and then come join us and you'll get to experience what it's like to do this kind of activity. So, um, our, so how we apply this is by doing the egg drop, and you should have picked up um, the, the, this is our explanation for our family nights. We give one of these out every single time we do a family night. Our goal is to do three a year. Unfortunately, this year we only are going to hit two family nights. But all of our family nights, we always try to have the scientific math and math standards that apply for um, for that type of activity, um, soon it'll be the Math Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards will be included on those. But for right now, we usually just have national standards. Um, we usually have something, a little bit of information on them that you know gives you a little bit of background knowledge about whatever the principle is involved for that night that we're focusing on, and then um, and then the rules. So the rules that we use for our family night are the rules that we got from NASA when we did our egg drop at um, Glenn Research Center. Some of them sound kind of funny, but apparently there's been an issue in the past. So um, each family gets a box and an egg furnished from Parkside. It's a six by six by six inch box. That's standard. We have talked about maybe next year making it a little bit more challenging and having an even smaller box because some of our students have done this for several years now are really good at this and we think, we think that they, we need to up the ante a little bit. We even talked about doing a lunch bag, lunch, a paper sack. So um, we will stick to the box this year, stay tuned for whatever we decide to do next year. Um, and then families bring their own packing materials. You get the egg on site. And then um, the rules are that everything has to be contained inside the box. So there can't be any parachutes or anything like that outside of the box. The, the box has to stay um, completely intact when it drops. So it can't drop and like split open or anything like that. And that's mainly just to cut down on mess so that we're not staying too late. Um, and packaging materials, <coughs> the no flammable substance, the carcinogens, the, obviously that's um, NASA stuff. But the ones I always thought were funny was when NASA told us we couldn't use the gelatin, peanut butter, fruit, vegetables, powder soap, oil, or jelly. And my first response was, cool. Who would have even thought of that? I don't think I would think about putting peanut butter in a box. But apparently, if it's been on here, it's been tried before. <laughs> and then um, NASA had a weight requirement. We don't have a weight requirement. We, we tried that the first year, and it, just, it became too complicated, and we thought to avoid for some of the fun for families. So we have no weight requirement on, on the box. I will tell you from past experience, the heavier, the heavier they are, they don't do as well. So I just want to keep that in the back of your mind. If you try this with us Tuesday, or if you try it um, at home. Um, the package must be relatively easy to open up. Um, that's just for your benefit. Um, we have a technician that releases all the, pack, the packages. For those of you who are familiar with Parkside, that technician is um, Lisa Medina. She's been releasing our, our eggs for us from that tower for, since we've been doing the program. Um, and then we, we have a special way we retrieve them to keep everybody safe, and then we have prizes. So it's a really fun thing to do. 
if um, any of you are interested. We also gave you uh, just the rules to take home. Um, the date is wrong. I will tell you on here it's from last year. It is this Tuesday. So make sure you change that um, on, on this sheet just so you don't show up on the 24th and none of us are there. Um, so it's in the cafeteria library area, which is out front of the main office, this Tuesday at 7 o'clock. And then those are, there's the rules down there that I read to you um, if you're interested in coming. So these are examples of our two boxes that we took that day. Um, and what we decided to do is we found in Michael's an egg, styrofoam egg, and we hollowed that out and put our egg in there. Um, and then we had it sur surrounded by styrofoam and our egg survived. That egg survived. Um, another way, so moving past the drop tower type thing, um, one of the coolest ways I think that NASA, well, other than the plane, because that's the ultimate coolest, one of the um, coolest things that um, NASA has to stimulate um, microgravity here on Earth is the Sunny Carter Training Facility, um, which is located in Houston. Um, so, so it's also called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. It's a big, huge pool, huge, gigantic pool. And it has the parts to various sign, uh, space um, vehicles in it, depending on what they're working on at the time. For the most part, standard, it has the mod a full-size uh, makeup of the different modules that make up the space station. Um, and when we were there, that's what was in the pool at the time. Although something tells me that one of the two years I was down there, um, they had Hubble in there too. They were they were waiting. To, they were going to do one of the spacewalks on Hubble. And so, what the Sunny Car Training Facility allows the astronauts to do is it allows them to go in in their full spacewalk. They call it EVA. The full EVA um, spacesuits and practice what they would be doing um, on a spacewalk before they even leave Earth. So. Um, the men and women that were doing spacewalks up on station or on shuttle um, were able to have hours and hours and hours of practice before they were out in space um, to do their activities. So I'm going to let Dawn tell you about um, which her impressions of the Sunny Cutter Train facilities. I think it's one of the coolest facilities that uh, Yes. No. This is a little, no, this is good. So this is a little bit of information about 6.2 million gallons of water is, is just huge. Um, so um, it explains the neutral buoyancy is the equal tendency of an object to sink or flow. It makes yeah, um, very, very heavy objects easy to move, which is why NASA uses it. And it allows them to practice all the things they're going to do on their spacewalk, because obviously they need to try to get it right the first time. And I can do that without a lot of practice. I think so. So in this pool, it's very deep. They have the model of the parts of the space station they're going to work on. And so then they're in full gear, and they get lowered down. They have other people that are there videotaping um, each part of what they're doing. And except for the drag, that's the closest they can get to being in their spacesuit and performing as they would out in space. So it gives them, you know, if there's problems, if they have problems with tools or problems with the space shuttle that they didn't anticipate, this is how they can foresee that and play friends with it get out there. It was incredible. It's very clear. They how often they filter the water through the of that. They filter through the water constantly. And so it's it's clear, it's crystal clear. You go in and you can see everything that they're doing. And at one of the sessions we were training, they had it on the TV and they had to stop, they had to shut it off because we were so engrossed in watching them that we weren't paying attention to our medical training for our um, Weightless wonder flight. So, yeah, so the Summit County Training Facility has the pool located in it, and it also has classrooms and the masks and the flight suits and the Hippo Beer Chamber and all those things in it to help train the astronauts for flight. Um, we had to go into the Hippo Beer Chamber um, for medical clearance. Um, how many of you ever seen the new Top Gun? You know in the movie The Top Gun where they have the men that are like playing the cards and games and that kind of thing and then they get really busy sitting in the one that's going to Yeah, we had to do that. Um, it, it's it's, it's a, actually a metal, considered a medical procedure and cannot be videotaped or anything like that. 
Um, and the purpose of it was for us to um, learn what hypoxia, hypoxia is for us so that when we're in the weight, let's wonder um, if we experience a, a drop in oxygen, we would know what our own personal symptoms were. Um, and should have been taken very seriously. However, we thought it was playtime. I mean, how often you can experience something like that? So, you know, the idea behind that experience was that we were supposed to, um, you know, we had to wait until we got up to altitude, which was how high did it? 20 some thousand feet we had to go up. And then we had to take our masks off. So it would be like you had the oxygen that would be up at that height, but you have no, you had no supplementation. And um, for me, the mask was the hardest part of the whole experience because I'm a claustrophobic person and it was not pleasant. But once we got the mask off and we started to experience hypoxia, the idea was that once we started experiencing those symptoms, we were supposed to put the mask back on. Well, not us. We thought it was fun. <laughs> So, you know, we kind of went through a little oxygen deprivation too and, um, and then put the, ma the mask back on. And then, for anyone, we did have my second year that I went up in the weightless wonder, we did have one of my colleagues experience basically what's called the bends. And she had to go in the hyperbaric chamber for um, about four hours. And so it, it can become a rather serious thing. But that's all housed at this facility. and. Um, it's just, it's, I think it's really cool that we have that stuff here. And I'm not sure if the public can actually get in to see that, but if you're ever in the area, it might be worth checking out. They were really careful when they took us to see this. Apparently, a group of four us had someone had tried to jump into the pool. So they kept us, we couldn't go down the staircase, we had to stay in a certain area. They didn't apparently trust us not to get in the pool. But someone had gone on the deck, hadn't jumped in, but they are very careful about nothing going in there that shouldn't be in there. And there was, um, we got the chance to talk to, um, I forgot which astronaut it was we talked to, but they were talking about how when they go in the, the water, it gives them a chance to, for their bodies to get used to and to acclimate to um, the experiences that they're going to have in space that, you know, they, they just need to learn how to handle that for themselves so they don't get out there and get in a panicky situation. Um, they were talking about the fishbowl experience that they have, you know, because their, their masks are rounded. So when we go in that water and that water distorts it, it makes them feel like they're in a fish fishbowl and it can make them extremely nauseous. And so they were talking about how they, this gives them, through many experiences, a chance to learn how their body, to adjust their body to those kinds of experiences. So it's a really cool thing. But um, as far as the microgravity is concerned, um, the big point of the pool, and for all of us who have been in a pool before, is that you know it gives you that buoyancy? So they have these very heavy, um, heavy spacesuits and all this equipment, and it gives them a chance to learn how they're going to manipulate that equipment, and because um, you move differently and everything in that kind of environment. So um, they get all that practice. This is the bottom of the comment. This is what I'm waiting to talk to you about. Because this is just the most unbelievable experience I think we've I've, either one of us have ever been through. I had the fortunate, um, I was fortunate enough to experience it twice. And I was the only person in the National Explorer School of History that had ever gone up in the back of town twice. Um, Dom went up for the second year, the first year, the first year. The first year was much better experience than the second year. Um, the, this is what we went up the, our first year in a NASA owned plane with NASA pilots who were used to conducting research. Um, the second year, NASA outsourced and went through Zero G Corps. And Zero G Corps is a place that um, I'm sure some of you have probably heard that it's in Las Vegas. There's a few places throughout the country you can actually pay to go into a plane like this. It's like two grand. And I'm not sure how much it is, but or how long you're out there, but you can, and it's like a thrill ride kind of experience. Um, when we go up, we're going up for, specifically to do research we went up for. And those are two very different experiences. So when you're trying to concentrate on writing, and you're trying to concentrate on collecting data and stuff like that, it's a much different experience than when you're just going up there and experiencing the, the, the weightless environment. And so, some of us got a little bit more nauseous the second year than we did the first year, let's just say. Never got sick, never got sick, but by the time the second year was, we're done the second year, I was ready to drop it. 
the first year was um, really cool. So what happens in the interior, the, the, the environment comment in the interior, everything's white. And the reason they do that is because um, you, your, your mind doesn't have a frame of reference. And that frame of reference is really what starts to make you sick. So we went through all this training about what to do with our bodies in 2G and what to do with our, our bodies when we're in the micro um, environment. And um, the 2G environment is usually when people get sick. So I think in the next, look in the next slide, I think I had to grab one. Go to the next one. There, right there. So um, this is what the plane does. The plane does these parabolas. And you can see where it talks about um, just that little section at the top of the parabola is where we experience the microgravity environment. And that's where we conducted our most of our research. And it's just a very, very short period of time, like 27 seconds, I think it was. And so, the, and so the rest of the time you're coming out of that microgravity environment, going down into 2G, and then going back up into the microgravity. So you want to tell them what that's that, that what that's like? Uh, at the beginning, you're in a normal plane. You're in your seats in the back. They fly out over the Gulf of Mexico. <coughs> they give you time to set up your experiment as a normal plane would fly out of your seat. And they recommend that you sit or lay down for the first few parabolas for your body to acclimate to the 2G it feels like a very heavy weight, like you're being pressed down into the plane. And that's not a comfortable feeling for most people. It wasn't comfortable for me, but um, you get used to it rather quickly. And then they start uh, nose over, and then it's just the opposite. Any little pressure, you shoot yourself to the top of the plane. If, I was, if this was the plane, I just fingertip pressure on this board, it would shoot me across the room for the microgravity part of it. And you don't really have a frame where your feet are over your head, which is not where they want you to be. And um, it is a lot of fun. <laughs> don't lie about that. And then um, then they let you know that you're going to, you're coming out of uh, microgravity. So you need to get your feet at the bottom of the plane. And then you do the 2G again. And it's repetitive. Um, they do 15 parabolas in a row consecutively. And so it's that constant 2G moment of 1G and then microgravity. So they do that so it's about a minute. So that experience about 15 straight minutes. And then they um, do they did a parabola where they change the ink um, the, the degree of what we're going down and they simulate and that allows them to simulate what it'd be like to experience gravity on the moon. And then this, this, they do the same thing for Mars. Um, so basically how this all works, the principles behind how this all works is what they, it kind of freaked me out the first time they told us what we were doing. They go up to 27,000 feet, thereabouts. And they, get, they get to the top of the, about the 27,000 feet. It, it changes by a few feet on um, each parabola. And then they basically cut the engine and the plane does this. And then so, like those experiences when you're on a commercial aircraft where you really don't want the plane doing that, and you're nose diving towards the earth, that's what we were doing, except we were nose diving towards the Gulf of Mexico. And then when they get to about down to about 10,000 feet or ish, they, quit, they pull it up and back up they go. And so what happens is we inside the plane are falling at the same rate the plane's falling. So we're basically, it's like we're all falling together, so it's like we're floating. And that's why it allows us to, um, to simulate microgravity environment. I, you know, we did, we did, got a chance to talk to the pilot. They're obviously, I mean, with that, they're very, very well trained. Um, they, they must have no fear. Because <laughs> I would have a really hard time sitting in the pilot's seat going towards, I know um, I've gone out on, I've flown a Cessna a few times. And, um, and when I was landing in a Cessna for the first time, I freaked out just on landing. So I can't imagine what a pilot's doing heading towards Earth that fast over the Gulf of Mexico and then also the last minute pulling up. And of course, the first thing that pops in my mind is what if, you know, they cut the engines. Well, what if it doesn't? I tell my students the closest uh, connection to that is if they've been on a roller coaster. So when they're going up, you have that pulling back into your seat. And just as you go over that first big hill, and you feel like you're being lifted out of your seat for that brief moment, that's what that free fall is like for several seconds when you're in microgravity. So it's that little bit where that, that car is pull, pulling you down with the roller coaster, but that moment when you're lifted out of your seat. 
that's what it feels like, but for like 30 seconds at a time. I so, can imagine the, the pilot <laughs> function that going on, what we have. The most of them are test pilots, um, by nature, trained test pilots, so I think they're a little bit more inclined to that kind of stuff. Most of them are, um, were passed by colonels in the, um, in the Air Force and the military, like Colonel Johnson. Colonel Johnson, you guys are in the latest one of kind of ours. And, um, you know, that's what his background experience was, was a test pilot. Um, I, I don't know. I, it's nothing I could ever do. Um, the, the, the coolest thing, um, that I found, well, the whole experience was cool, but the, one of the most amazing things I walked away and had a chance to reflect on, on the experience of the Vomit Comet was how fast our human body adjusts. So we went through a whole day of training about, oh, hold your head this way when you're in 2G because, you know, we went and how to clear your ears because we're going up and down so rapidly. Um, you know, you're, you can have probably with your vestibular system. So how to clear your ears if they not pop. We, we went through all that kind of training. And, um, but the coolest thing was because the inside of the plane's all white, your body loses its frame of reference. And within, like Dawn said, two parabolas, our body could adjust to that fast to that environment. And then from that point on, we were, we were good to go. Um, of course, me, you know, they tell you not to do something. There were students in here. <laughs> but um, so they said, you know, keep your head really still and stuff um, when you're in that 2G environment. So of course, I, someone said something to me, not intentionally. Someone said something to me, and I turned my head real quick, uh, and the whole the whole inside the plane starts doing this because uh, it goes off your. Visit. But it adjusted really quick, and it did. But then I was dared on the second to the last parabola to look out the window. Mm -hmm. And of course, so I had to do it. <laughs> so I had two parabolas left. I have nothing to lose, right? And some of the, I don't know if I have a picture in here, but some of the, one of the coolest pictures I have of me on the plane is looking out that window. And the, and, the, and the neatest thing about it was when I looked out that window, I didn't have a clue as what I was looking at because my body had adjusted to this white environment. And all we were feeling, so all we were experiencing and feeling in there was to get really, really heavy and then really, really light and floating. That was the only thing our body, we did not know we were, or we knew, but our brains knew, but our bodies did not feel us doing this. And so all we felt was the sensation of being really, really heavy and really, really light. And um, so I looked out that window all over the Gulf of Mexico, which is blue, with blue sky, and I had not a clue to what was up or down. I didn't know what was ocean, and, and of course you're at an angle like this, so the, the horizon is at an angle like this, so you're sitting there looking at it going, am I up, am I down, what, what, what am I doing? And that's kind of where it kind of starts to make you feel a little bit nauseous. I didn't, but I'm a roller coaster freak, so maybe that's fine. Want to go back to that slide before? So this kind of explains what we've already talked about. Um, these things will be up on the website for the, the conference. So um, it gives you some links and things that you can, you can go to. It just, that just talks about how many seconds we're, uh, we're in. Yeah. So this was year one. Um, and so the, this is Wagner, and a much younger me. And Ms. Weatherwax and Mr. Marsh, for those of you who know, that was our team the first year. And the guy that's on the left kneeling um, was an uh, electrical engineer for mission control. And he was our mentor from NASA that was assigned to um, us because you would not you would not believe the paperwork we had to do. And so they were kind of there to help us work through all that red tape and get our clearances and stuff like that. Um, the cool thing was, is his connection to mission control, and we were able to go down on the floor, he got down on the floor, so that was kind of cool experience. These are um, my brain children for our first experiment. Um, the, our experiment, what we'll show you in a little bit, that we took off was actually the brainchild of Andrew Lavery. Um, his, his dad's Dr. Lavery, the eye specialist here in town. Um, so yeah, so he was my brainchild. Um, I actually went to Andrew in the summer of the year before we did this, and I said, Andrew, do you have a chance to go up on this plane? Well, actually, you don't, but I do. And so you've got to come up with this really cool experiment so I can go up in this plane. 
And so he's like, sure, Mrs. Dow. And so he um, came up with this uh, um, very, very elaborate magnetics experiment, which we just, there was no way we had the financial backing or the ability to do. And so through that, he and I met, because this experiment, we had to submit our proposal like in August when all the kids were off. So he and I worked in the summer to tone it down and come up with something that was actually feasible that we could do. So our experiment, I always say that our experiment was the brainchild of Andrew. And I'm thankful for him because he gave me the chance to go home and play <laughs> So these were, and I think you got these, these were the, um, these were the predictions that our students, as we just went through, set the proposal, initial proposal off. These were the hy hypotheses, so to speak, that our children came up with the next year. So um, we actually had to fall, we flew in February. So they said that they think that the amount of times that you wrap an electromagnetic would make a difference in the performance of the magnet here on Earth and in microgravity. Um, so our experiment was on electromagnets. Um, they thought that electromagnets perform differently in one G environment versus on orbit, and that they thought that the coatings on the materials that we had in the um, in our tubes would make a difference. So we had like paper clips that were coated and paper clips that weren't coated, and so that was our that was how we initially started with our, And then as we did our initial on ground experiments at the end of the through the year till February, this kind of modified and changed a little bit. Um, we did end up going with the amount of times it was wrapped, and we did end up going with the coatings. Um, I think I think that the first year. But um, so what our students did was um, throughout the years we were prepping for this is we did the on ground drop box um, experience just like NASA would do. So we tried to follow them through that process as close as we could. And we had, so this is our experiment down here. And we'll give you guys a chance to look at it later. We had a smaller box, same type of box as about this size. And we put back then, which was, would have been the equivalent of a flip camera today, but this was like two years ago. And we put that in the box with one of our tubes and um, dropped it from the roof at Parkside. And then um, what that did was we were able to see what was happening inside the box as it was falling. Um, and, th and that's a kind of physics kind of thing that's done in a lot of physics classrooms is by putting that camera in there. And so by, by doing that, the kids were able to modify it and change um, their experiment before we actually have the plane. So this is our experiment. Um, we kind of joke. We had bad access to Houston. Um, I'm not sure it would get there today. Um, I think we might be questioned, but we didn't have a problem back then. So um, our experiment was designed with the help of the Toyota um, Toyota Research Facility in Ann Arbor, the engineers there, um, the engineers at NASA, and um, Elro here in town helped us. Um, with some of the materials. And so um, basically we had these cylinders and inside the cylinders we had electromagnetic the magnet and the first year we had the first year we had paper clips on each side, second year we had paper clips on one side and rock boxes in the second. Um, and so they, they set up these uh, we had six electromagnets going, um, three on one side were all the same, three on the other side were all the same. And then the, up here in the diagram it shows you Give you a little bit of visual about what was going on in these two. All of these pictures we had to have in our report that went to NASA, which was about 20 to 25 pages long. And there's us. So, this is obviously in a microgravity environment. Um, that is Kurt Petternell, who was um, our mission special guy. That was him on one side. He and I flew the first day together. And that was me. Yeah, can you tell how hard, how hard I am? I'm working. <laughs> you want to talk about what you did up there? Uh, I was the alternate, so originally I was not supposed to fly. I went in case someone else on the day of the flight could not attend, could not make the flight, or didn't pass all the, the tests once we got there to be able to fly. Um, but the day before our flight, they had some room and they asked all the alternates from the different schools if we wanted to fly and we're like, absolutely. So uh, the experiment that I'm, that's behind me is from another school. 
their experiment was on the effects of baking, uh, vinegar and baking soda mixing if they would mix in microgravity. So they had somebody on their team that was not able to fly, so I helped them with uh, their experiment. So my job basically was to put my hands in the little thing and, and open up the valves for the vinegar to see if it would flow or not. And they had theirs hooked up to a computer to collect their data. So this is kind of in between when we were done and Jill seriously or they're collecting data as well. Um, it was no fun. <laughs> it was miserable work. You know. It was somebody has to do it. They did mix. They did mix. They had a couple little errors with theirs, like the gloves thing kept coming out of the, uh, the container, which was they had to be sealed because of the liquid. They didn't want any liquids or anything actually floating around the plane. <coughs> um, but everything, all the liquids were self-contained, just the gloves would go in and you know, they had some issues with that. They just they were very secure. So I had to keep trying to fix down the microgravity, which wasn't on my head. Feet above my head, upside down, trying to get those um, so we flew two days. Um, I flew with Kurt my first, the first day, and then the rest of my team flew the second day. So what they allowed us to do was make, we were allowed to take the, the experiments off the plane that night, um, make any modifications we wanted to make to them that afternoon if we had ever done. The plane reloaded for the next morning, and so, um, so it was, it was, it was really how things would work in a real, in a real research. Before the first day of your test readiness, before the first day of flight. There are several people from NASA that ask you questions about your experiment, and you have to pass your test readiness review before you can even take it off. Have you done all of They're working on there. Oh, very very picky. They ask lots of questions, um, and if, if their experiment the baking soda and vinegar, if they couldn't convince them that it all stayed contained, that wouldn't have gone on. So this was them actually trying to work and collect data on our experiment, and. Um, so they had straps up above and straps down below, and it was a challenge, um, obviously, because you're trying to read numbers on a small strip um, while you're hanging upside down. And that was one of the modifications we had to make when we got there. Is we had to add styrofoam spacers at the bottom of the tubes because we could not read. If it didn't move or knew very much, the, the end cap of the tube blocked what we were supposed to be able to see. So we had to raise that from the bottom of the tube so we could actually collect that up. Now, you only have 27 seconds of weightlessness right. to do this. Right. But about 30 times. But about 30 times. Okay. Yeah. And it was actually, we were actually, and we, we filed the philosophy of keeping it simple um, because we knew the times, some of the schools got more complex and more complex they got, the more problems they had. Now, NASA actually had, NASA had experiments they were flying with us. As a matter of fact, the, the second year I went out, they were doing a physiology, human physiology experiment. And we never really knew what they were doing those poor people back that plane. But, um, they were doing something on them, something to them. And um, I think it was something with eye movement or something like that. And so, um, so anyways, uh, so yeah, so you only have a very short window, but uh, several times, repetitive. And we were, and then we were collecting um, data both in the microgravity and the 2G environment. And the 2G environment was much more challenging than even, um, as you'll see from a picture I have here in a minute. And so we actually were done by about probably 25. Jacob, that Velcro. What you want? The Velcro's on the green. Oh, there's tape. You can put duct tape on. And you put the Velcro on on that, so you can lift it up. That's all padding. It's all padded. Yeah. Uh, for obvious reasons. <laughs> and they have tracks where they hook the straps in. And the harder you hang out of the strap, the more quickly your feet go up over your head. So it was a definite learning curve. I mean, your first first of all, the, the first problem they're allowed to leave you let you up from lying down. Your initial instinct is to do what? Swim. Swim. Because you got and you can't touch anything. You're in the You're middle. like going like this, and of course all the nasty people are laughing at us. Because <laughs> yeah. they know that won't work.
um, which is going to lead us into our next session, which is Toys in Space, and that's where I'm going to allow you guys to do stuff, um, is uh, I have a paddle ball that I'm trying to use in 2G. That's what I'm doing right here. But I was in motion, so it didn't show up. So I think the next picture. Oh, these little bags right here, those look like roses. Those were our vomit bags that we never used. <laughs> Everyone wanted to have that still on them. Yeah, we had to have, and they made sure they were sticking out in the whole thing. We never used them. One person. <laughs> There's Mr. Marsh. He doesn't know that picture. That's him and Micro. That's Don and Micro. Jill's feet up in the air, which is where Jill's feet usually were. We're trying to get pictures of some of the activities we're doing. That was challenging as well. Mrs. Weatherwax still was our, um, she was our daredevil for the trip. I, I didn't get to experience what she was doing. I only saw it from video later. But there was always a NASA person close by her because she was yeah. feet up in the air. Yeah, she was flying around the plane. Flying around the plane. I had to grab her ankle and pull her back because she was floating away. <laughs> Oh, I, don't, I must be in the next one. I must have the next and the next cross over for the next session. I'm um, the one where they need the paddle ball. Um, so we kind of wanted to end with this for this session. You know there was a lot of talking for this one. I, I apologize. I hope it was kind of interesting. Um, the next one we're going to give you more hands-on kind of stuff. We want to do a text experiment and answer questions. And then um, um, because our toys in space, Activities we did on the VAM account, and that's why we wanted to add for this. So, questions? Um, if you have the heads or you're floating, and then all of a sudden you Yes, every single time.